happens in two games against Spenu and just the one game against SKT where he actually asserted himself pretty well in a loss. We're going to come out to Champion Select. Edge is the really big factor to me. How does this change how KT wants to draw? Yeah, and there's the Azir ban, and we already have some answers to that. They have the same questions about Edge. What can we take away from this guy? And of course, Goong, not an Azir player, so that is not very relevant. Interesting that KT is banning the Rise here, because I feel that by Jyn Air giving Duke the Rise and making Najin prioritize it, that they had I would say a good answer. They played around that very well. And if we look at score in someday, two of the stronger, or score in a Chaser rather, two of the stronger junglers in this league, you'd think they'd be able to control that pick. And Jinnan in general, they played a really dangerous game against Najin. They gave them kind of the, their own noose to hang themselves, but actually were able to execute on giving away Rise and playing against it more impressively than I've seen in basically any scene. But in this situation, KT just want to take it out of the champion pool. Maybe it's one of those champions that kind of moves away some of Someday's champion pool, one of the champions he wants to break out. And if we do see, as you talked about, score prioritizing more and getting Someday ahead, if Ryze is a blocker champion, maybe smart just to ban it away. Absolutely. So what is going to be the last ban here? Most teams ban Gragas against Watch. It's one of the few champions that he's really shown up on this season. And if you take that away, no, they are going to eliminate the Nautilus. Of course, a uh, big pick for Najin, not only in the support role, but Duke will play it as well. And that means that almost certainly Najin will take Gragas because Watch kind of needs every bit of help he can get. And he wants to move away from the Evelyn as quick as possible. So in this pick and ban, Alistair and Nautilus band away. You might not think that's big because these are two big meta supports. Six and two is pure on the Alistair. 4-2 and two on Nautilus, that's 14 out of his 19 games have been on those two supports. So champion pools are bound. We already mentioned two mid lane bans by Najin against Edge. Suddenly, when it comes to comfort picks across the board, not many available. If they do go for a very early victor, that does kind of make me think that they're not confident on, K on Edge on some of these other champions. And Annie locked in right away. KT known as a very all-in team. They take the victor as well. This may force Goong onto something like Cassiopeia. And I know you've got a fun stat on Annie. You might be surprised, but the Annie priority, despite the fact that she saw, of course, that auto attack range nerf, but both this week and in general, in all the games, there's been 102 games played in champions so far this season. The highest win rate champion of more than 10 picks is Annie at 13 and 4, or 77% win rate, completely in the support role. It shows the priority. When we see double AD, the likes of Varus mid, these squishy backlines, Annie's one of the few champions with the instant cast CC to really be able to wreck their days. Yep, so that is, and Fixers also played it quite well, so. This is definitely something to expect from KT. They do prioritize that victor, not only to deny Goon, and most likely, I mean, here's the other aspect of this, mm -hmm. Pabas Medi. Goon also has been very successful with Zed into victor in the past. He's not going to go for it tonight. It will be that Cassiopeia. That surprises me a little bit, because in some ways, you're playing right into Goon's hands, and instead, he's going to take the safer pick, but one where he may not be able to dominate the matchup quite as heavily as we've seen in the past. Maybe that's just a confidence pick for Goong. Even though he hasn't necessarily been winning on it, this is four out of his last six appearances have been on the Cassiopeia. Didn't look very convincing in game two against Jyn Air, but they've gone for comfort for Edge. They've picked up the victor that he has already played in competitive. Now the Cassiopeia matchup, I don't really rate the Cassiopeia matchup into Victor. I mean, she can dominate the lane if she gets ahead at level two or takes Ignite, but can struggle with just the very easy line wave clear from Victor. So OQ here, uh, we've seen the Vayne Cassiopeia be a big priority for Najin. Do they actually want to go with it against the Sivir? OQ's played under that matchup quite a few times and been A-OK, -okay, but nope, it will be Corky. I actually think Vayne is a great pick here. They have the Gragas and the Cassiopeia. They could take Vayne Maokai, but they're not going to commit to that late game to the same degree. Interesting. I actually agree with you on this point. There's four champions on Nigel's side that can peel for a vein. In the back line, it looked like she'll be relatively safe. If you're going to, and I, I kind of wondered, would Nigel throw out the gambit of leaving the Sivir open? You know Arrow's going to snap that away with a 7 and 2, 11.3 KDA record, and then just go for the laning option, go for the vein who can really overtake Sivir and take her out, both in kind of a split push sense, but in the team fights, be very safe. Going for Corky tells me they must prioritize early skirmishing, early fights around Dragon, because Vayne, maybe that would have tipped their hand towards the mid to late regardless.
I still think Vayne is definitely the best pick here. I think they have enough to, to a lot deal of with magic it. magic damage as well. And you're, do, you're putting OQ on one of his best picks right there also. So a bit confusing to me. Uh, KT, they need some primary engage. Renekton, interesting. This is uh, one of Sunday's big picks all time. I am concerned that they don't have any primary. Well, they have the Annie for the primary yep. engage here. So they've got it locked down. And Renekton has gotten some buffs recently, but this is the first time he's been played all year in Korea. And we have to wonder, is there indirect buffs to Renekton? Because there's an item like Black Cleaver. You're going to buy at yep. least one or two offensive items. Tiamat has for so long been the one item slot damage item, just because, again, you activate that Tiamat active and you cancel out of the cast animation for your W. But Black Cleaver would itemize very well. He really likes cooldown reduction, but finds it hard to itemize when there was a lot of cooldown reduction removed from Spirit Visage, which of course was a very common pickup from Renekton. I saw it back when I was casting the Oceanic scene a little bit since his buffs a few patches ago. It can be very powerful, but on paper at least, tank battles in the top lane. Yeah, and over Someday's career, uh, Renekton is his most played champion. Uh, he's been picking it on and off meta, but not so far this year. 27 games played, 19 and 8 all time. So it always has been a big, big pick for him. And I've been waiting to see it, considering those buffs I thought were pretty decent. And now we will, up against this Maokai. Black Cleaver gonna do a lot of work for Sivir and Rek'Sai also. Great engage here from KT, very fast composition and interesting stuff. Well, we are going to be going into game one here between KT Rolster and Najin Empire. Let's get into the match. Here we go. First game, Najini Empire versus KT Rolster. The battle to get out of fifth place. Exciting stuff starting already. We'll see if Goon can redeem himself a little bit on this Cassiopeia, at least against a top team. Of course, Edge coming in. Only four games in his three games so far. This is his fourth in the professional scene. Played a couple in the preseason, but way back in December of last year. So we didn't see a lot of this in our series we cast together two days ago, but some very aggressive invades for Vision. What teams were doing, instead of doing these aggressive invades, were really starting with an early jungle follow, not soloing down camps, but having the top laner and the jungler just really farm and giving perhaps solo gromp experience to the top laner, for example, but continuing the faster jungle follow. Instead of going for the aggressive invades, two members of Najin back, but still three man in the bottom. Well, I think KT really wants standard lanes here. There's a reason why they picked this Renekton. Many and many also many having many that many. good level one through five with Sivir and Annie up against the Corky and Thresh lane. You can see the lane swap coming in from Najin. So it will be a lane swap. That should favor Najin. Of course, Maokai gonna have an easier time in the jungle early on. And look at what Someday is doing. They have excellent vision in the enemy jungle, and it looks like he wants to solo out the Raptors, as far as we can see. Yeah. That starts with his Q, of course. I'm not on the shortest cooldown at level one, but relative safety with so much vision in the enemy jungle. And the only information he needed was whether they were starting red buff or not. It doesn't matter that they walked through lane to go ahead and go for that, so he should be okay. Najin shouldn't see him doing this. There's just no reason for them to walk over that nope. area, despite it being so <laughs> close when we have complete information with the observer mode toggled over. Steals away a camp, so that actually really slows down the jungle follow if they continue it as well. Yeah, it indeed it does. So they're gonna walk up and actually be really confused right now that that happened. Start pinging over to the Wolves on the other side. Someday just going to join Score for a follow afterwards. And now they are going to walk in. So actually, KT doesn't know that they started on this side. Yeah, they actually really outfoxed themselves <laughs> yes. in this particular situation. They thought they were going for a buff and they'd find no camps at all. So it's that happened because Najin walked through the brush in the lane and not from their base to go to that objective. So actually, this ends up delaying KT more than anything else. They're going to try and see if they can get a dive right here. But because but of that ward at the red buff, there's no reason for anyone to enter lane and bottom. And there's a very realistic chance of a three buff start for Najin. Absolutely. 
especially if they, if their war just fading on the enemy red right now for Najin, and they can push this forward. Pure, this is a big commitment to this gang. Well, they're worried about the fast push. Remember, this is Sivir in the bottom lane and Annie, who has a very safe auto attack. So they're looking for the fast push, or at least considering their options around bottom turret. The Trinket Ward runs out at their own red buff. It looks like they won't be three buffed, especially with three members of Najin being sent bottom. So, tower down at 50%. Let's take stock of this. OQ freezing in the top lane, so they don't have any tower pressure yet. And now, Pure and Watch and Duke are all coming into the lane, but there's no one else there to take it as KT backs off and heads back to their own jungle on the camps that have spawned. So, a bit awkward early on. Uh, like you said, KT, I think, outfoxing themselves right there, trying a tricky little lane swap, but their wards were enough to give them some information, but not enough. If you try and work out who's been the big winner of the four minutes of hijinks, I guess you could say that Renekton was forced to use his teleports as a slight summoner advantage. They did manage to get the reverse push, so they basically got, this is KT, 50% damage on the bottom turret for no real cost. You look at the CS versus they're even between Corky and Siva, so very even across the board. 50% turret damage for a teleport. Well, that said, though, even though the CS, as we see some trading going down, nice W from Fixer, but uh, as we see some trading going down, the, the nice thing for Najin is that they have this Corky going to be higher levels, and that is going to skip the point of the game where he is a little bit more vulnerable to the Sivir and hit level six where he can trade more evenly. And just simply, it's Corky versus Renekton. It's a lane bully melee champion against one of the best, actually. If you're gonna throw an AD carry top lane, Corky was always one of the most uh -oh. popular picks. Because he can get really aggressive. Watch may even flash here. Some days on about 200 health. Wait oh, to see. Oh, he goes for it, and there's the first blood. Watch coming into the top side, and someday not gonna use his flash right there. It was a, caught between a rock and a hard place. And that is rough already, giving OQ that big carry force from Najin, the first blood gold. And we thought, as you could see, KT felt pressured in the bottom lane because Arrow actually used his heal to try and help score get into unborrow range. So basically used to summon it for no result whatsoever. Kill goes over to the Corky, now level five. What can a lane bully like Renekton, a very fiercely melee champion, maybe even arguably more melee than Hecarim, because of course his Q has a much lower uptime, do in a lane now against Maokai. Okay, so it's going to be Maokai, same level, double Dorans and a cloth armor, though, a huge item advantage for the Maokai. Yes, yeah, someday got killed, went back, but he didn't have enough money to get what he wanted right there with only eight CS before returning to lane. Not even a second arm. Yeah, and their edge actually just going to get the petrifying gaze, has to flash, does a bit of trading with his Q and his E, but that is a gank that Gets a nice couple of summoners out there using his heal also. Yeah, Goon getting two for one offer. Gets both of Edge's summoners in exchange for his flash. Still has cleanse available. And with Fixer maybe unleashed, because we had started with a lane sub, although with the return of two V2s, cleanse could still be very relevant as Fixer sniffs around mid lane. Yeah, trying to get some deep wards in. Sivir playing back with that pickaxe right now, building into an Avarice Blade as a second item. So Arrow. Really not going to be very powerful for quite some time based off of this itemization. It feels bad to be sitting on a Brawler's glove, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Not an ideal time to back if you're Arrow. But KT, they need to make some plays on the map right now. I am a bit worried about them in the late game because Najin has this Maokai. It's going to get absolutely huge. Gragas, no slouch when it comes to late game tanking either. And someday, you know, I'm not sure with these Renekton changes how much effect he's going to have compared to the Maokai in the late game. Some of his damage was shifted towards the late yeah. game. It felt like some of the buffs were definitely toned down what was at one point a very oppressive laning phase for some late game power. But where do you go in the item build? That's the big question that I don't think anyone's answered. Just because we haven't seen much Renekton in the last year, you'd have to say, ever since Renekton versus Shivana was the staple top lane matchup uh, of the day. Okay, we'll score, just gonna clear out some wards around the mid side. Cassiopeia going for the scuttle crab. And it's it's not arrow, it's actually just the real the real crab. <laughs> Maybe later. Maybe later. Get the two for one scuttle crab. The dream. So score going for the early bomby cinder here. No sight stones yet for our junglers this early in the game. 
So all wards still must be bought. OQ taking a little bit of a bad trade right there, but Lantern helps mitigate some of the damage. And KT, you know, they, they need to start making some plays here. They, they have this Cassiopeia in the mid lane without flash. That is an open invitation for Rek'Sai and Annie to get there if they can. But with the wards and the pressure in the bottom lane, it does make things a bit more tricky. So Watch is up top lane. Now, if he shows there is potential for some dragon threat, although no defensive wards or clearing being done by KT, of course, Watch showing himself should mean that's relatively safe to answer with a dragon. But for now, kind of frustrated, sitting twirling his barrel in the brush. I think somebody may know he's there. If we look, there's a ward right by the Gromp. So that would indicate that there's a strong possibility that Watch could still be going for a lane gank on the top side. Also, someday has one defensive pink and tri brush, so he has to be careful. Does not get ganked right there due, due to his cautious play. And here comes Score for a Raptor steal. We have fun buff to Sinai's looking for the potential gank over to Goon. Goon steps up. There is space for this gank. No flash still available. Watch is the there. And everyone is there, actually. Even OQ, Score has to turn his back to the petrifying gaze and flash over the wall. OQ will get some free hits. Score a little bit lucky to escape from that one. His pink wards will be cleared out, but they had a they had a sense he might be there. Two pink wards on the lower side of the river. Still really nice mechanics to not get stunned and be able to open up enough distance to get away from three members. So credit to Score made the boast of what was a pretty bad situation. Yeah. It's level six right now, so Void Rush will be available to get him down to that bottom side to defend anything if necessary. Watch, certainly doing a lot better this game than in his last series, but that's what happens, you know. I feel like you don't give Watch the Gragas, and he can't have this kind of performance. And Watch just hasn't been able to get his hand on Gragas since very early in the season. I believe it was three and one on that champion, so 5.8 KDA, definitely the, the healthiest, healthiest of his KDAs after he really tanked the Evelyn KDA last time out. Yeah, and I just feel this is such an important champion for Watch. He never has that big of an effective champion pool as a player, and it seems like you take away that one, which teams learn very early on, and he did when he started the season have impressive performances on Gragas, but not so much since he was denied that pick so I do wonder about the Nautilus over the Gragas ban for KT Rolster, especially since they could have done what Janair did and just take the Rek'Sai away. A lot invested by Edge onto Hexcore upgrades. He actually has two Hexcore upgrades already uh, very early into the game. So 2,000 gold spent on Hexcores and basically only boots to go along with the Doran ring. Summoners, all summoners actually available in mid. Vix is there as well. We're looking for the flash engage. Nice lantern, pure there, and you can see OQ just playing very well around mid pressure this game. Second time he's come up the map, and they're going to go in. Watch with the explosive casket. There is Fixer just gets destroyed. Summoner heal not going to be enough to save him, and that means that Edge has got a flash also as he gets hit by the death sentence. Excellent rotational play from Najin. Look at the wards littering the dragon side. Lots of blue wards, not a lot of red vision. Siva, Arrow just happy to stay in lane. Still doesn't have that Avarice blade, so only just really practicing farming. Rotational play from AD Carry, not something we usually talk about at 10 to 12 minutes, but nice from OQ. Yeah, OQ is just doing great. Picks up another kill right there as well. He's really getting rolling, and this is scary. Someday that main carry threat held down, oppressed this game. You can see falling behind in CS, and with OQ getting huge, this is usually the Najin ticket to victory. And OQ just pressing up, pressing forward, just getting that minion wave up, and then moving with the rest of his team to try and get kills around the mid lane, maybe thinking Goong needs a little bit of help on this Cassiopeia after his rather weak laning phase against Jin Air, and Goong's getting it. Still have a lot of questions about where this someday Ren uh, Renekton is going, whether it's item choice, whether it's role in team fights. If he's just going to be damage soak, tanky Renekt uh, Renekton, doesn't really feel like it's really a top meta pick at the moment. I mean, you have to think with the Hex Drinker, he's just going for a laning item. It doesn't really tell us whether he's going to go pure tank from here or really build the damage. It's not really a, only a laning item against Najin's composition, though, which is very low on attack damage. So that should be effective into the late game, one would think. And KT, it's another ticket to victory they could have here. A magic resist stacking, a nice early Aegis could turn the tides. 
considering that Corky just not that big of a damage threat, and Najin has really comped into a very single damage type uh, role here. But OQ, 13 minute trendy force, so <laughs> he is yeah, <laughs> super powered, maybe mostly magical damage as you mentioned, but still has a lot of turret pushing threat. Now, are they going to try and rotate someone and get him into mid lane, try and potentially break a turret because it feels to me if you just sit in lane with trendy force okay you're going to win damage trades but you either need to gank the lane and open up dragon just do something because otherwise you're missing a really strong powerful timing window for corky yeah i totally agree with you Najin has that control though they're going to start taking away this blue buff with all the pressure they have at the bottom side good call from Najin and from watch can they hand it over they're gonna have to smite it away they will just smite it with watch get a little bit antsy right there. Cassiopeia just there for the backup. And that means Edge is going to be denied. And it's a hard thing for a rookie to take. Still that same CS gap existing in the top lane. Had another charge of the smites. No real downside of smiting away from Watch. And again, that's good. You're playing around bot side. Right now, Watch has no reason to go to the top side of the map. Already have the advantage on the uh, Maokai against Renekton. And you, if there's ever a skirmish, you've got Trinity Force Corky backing you up. Whether it's Dragon or Ganks around bottom side, that is the point of power for Najin 15 minutes into this game. And Watch has his sweeper right now. Could have swept out the Dragon Pit, decided not to. Najin can really just kind of go for this Dragon at any time if they use that sweeper on the pit and just, just start it. They have two sweepers available. Nice blue steel. No, it's both sweepers used. So. And I wait to see. It's smart of score to play around the top. They are not looking to opt into any sort of skirmish on the bot side. Maybe try and gank the Maokai. He's already very, very tanky, though. Smart of Najin. Eventually, they do start this dragon, but complete information available to KT. And KT knows they're just going to give it up. Up. That is whew, close there. One HP left on that blue buff. And Thankfully, Cinder Hulk can't steal it away <laughs> yes. with the burn. But Najin pick up the first dragon that, honestly, they've invested most of their first 16 minutes into engineering the safest of dragons possible. Yeah, very methodical shot calling from Najin here. I like the way we're seeing them play the map, and that's a big concession from KT, trading a dragon for a blue buff early in this game. What is their plan for a comeback? Because, you know, you look at the Najin composition, and yeah, they're mostly one damage type, but they still have a ton of late game power with the Maokai and the Cassiopeia. If I was going to give a tip to one of these teams in the late game, you just have to give it to Najin because purely, Renekton's kind of still a head scratcher. Might be better in the late game, but will probably pale in comparison to the Maokai. They're trying to catch score, but of course very slippery is the Rek'Sai. What are ours today? So just trying to keep on top of them. Rek'Sai, <laughs> Renekton. No Rengar this time. Thankfully. I, I uh... Score mercifully. <laughs> I'm really happy when we don't see when we don't see Rengar in the current meta. What are you saying? Score is two and zero on that champion. Stats don't lie, Papa Smith. That's true. They always 100% reflect reality, in with all of its many nuances as well. Indubitably. <laughs> uh, pure. Score is honestly just showing too much presence around bottom. I don't think there's any real reason to. When you see Avarice Blade, no Infinity Edge Sivir. Just kind of want to say, okay, you do your thing, I'm going to focus somewhere else. Yeah, Watch has been there taking his entire bottom side jungle, has that wolf camp spirit as well, told him where Score was, and Score just simply has to get out of there. Watch actually just knocking him around a little bit, but not really going to come to much. Explosive cask used, but no follow-up from Goom. It's a pretty big cooldown, but uh, at the moment probably not going to be too much he can impact. Top lane has actually been the lane that's isolated, and we talked about Black Cleaver. That is the, a phage completed by Renekton, so definitely some damage coming from the Renekton. But this means, Papa, that they're really going to have to commit, I think, to a split push for a pretty long time before this Renekton is very viable in some of these team fights. They have to get that attack damage from Sivir, and since Sivir went for that Avarice Blade, the synergy just not going to be quite there with the Magic Shred at this point in time. So will he be able to out the Maokai? You have to think that Someday has been cranking the practice in this champion. His 11th unique pick so far this season. Always been a champion that he's played a lot, so he must be confident in the matchup. Black Cleaver, maybe like when Na picks up a Black Cleaver, maybe that'll be a point of power where he'll be able to out the Maokai, even though he's consistently been 12 to 20 CS behind the Maokai. I'm excited to see it, though. Uh, this is going to tell us a learn lot. Something. Yeah, we are definitely going to learn something today. But with the Frozen Heart, 
inching closer to completion from Duke, though. Will he have the answer? Will that black cleaver be enough? Oh, Scorn's going to get hooked right there, but it's not going to stop him from clearing the pink board. You know what I want to know, too, is how are they going to execute this combo? Because if you get the black cleaver stacks down with the Q from someday, uh, Arrow's ricochets are going to be absolutely ridiculous. So there's a lot of AOE attack damage here. Ironically, it's not only the Q that has to be talked about. Yep. Remember, W, yep. especially if it's empowered or Fury empowered, is at three autos instantly. So we're talking about basically instant stack, Q, W, and an auto attack. That's five stacks of the Black Cleaver already. It's a lot to put on Arrow, but nine and two, and if he can get these items going, his auto attacks are going to be shredding down even the tanky Malco. Exciting stuff. So, Najin, still presence on the bottom side. They don't have the speed shrine this time. Watch just going to lumber straight through that and route to the bottom side of the map. But Najin just emphasizing OQ's lead right here. Duke doing just fine. Of course, Duke, one of the best top laners in the laning phase in this league, absolutely. And he's holding his own after the early death. Now they're just kind of going at each other in the top side. Duke really winning that trade very easily. I think KT only feigning aggression around this dragon. It looks like they might even lose their blue buff as well. They just don't have the item timings to opt into any sort of fight. They do not want to call down someday because he has not itemized for an early skirmish compared to Righteous Glory and the majority of a Frozen Heart. Uh, Fix are going to get hooked. Here come the TPs, though. There is a Tibbers. Doesn't get a stun down, though. But they do secure the blue buff for it, it looks like. Did they get it? No teleport from Duke, however. Who ended up with that blue buff? The watch did. Okay. So they so, used a the teleport to lose ooh. a blue buff. That's a bit of a spenu teleport there, Monte Cristo. Yeah, that is that is rough. Also, two ultimates popped. Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. Flash from, from Fixer as well. Yeah. Flash from Pure, Flash from Watch, but that there are a lot of options left. As Duke takes down the tower, someday just not able to go toe to toe with the Maokai. We saw him lose about half his health for nearly nothing in return top side and now the teleport they want it well Duke is just gonna awkwardly be really slow he doesn't even have boots <laughs> mm, the teleport <laughs> mechanics not notable in the 20 minute span of this game it did however push them off the tower and get the turret so you know they they did use the teleport but they got an objective off of it certainly it would have been nice for them to get a kill also but very unlikely without boots, uh, any boots at all going in that you'd be able to catch up to Arrow and Fixer. Fixer, of course, with the Moby boots. So, so Malka has to respond to the minion wave pushing in. Now he's kind of caught in two minds because Dragon spawns in 10 seconds. Both sides have stolen away the respective blue buffs. Can KT with a freshly shopped Black Cleaver Renekton actually answer the first dragon? Because it's just about to spawn. They certainly don't have wards in the area. But without any teleport available on either of the top laners, it feels like the first team to really set up will have a big positional advantage. Yeah, not to mention Black Cleaver done and Infinity Edge done. This is going to be big. Can Someday and Arrow get the Armor Shred combo down? Because that burst could turn the tides of this fight, Goong. Spitting out some poison to clog the choke point right there. KT, not a lot of wards around this dragon right now. Najin firmly in command of the bottom side of the river. Arrow gets chunked out just a tad right there. I don't think KT can do this. Yeah, everyone has cooldowns available. No flash, of course, from Annie, but Tibbers is available. But how do you get on top of someone as Renekton? You have the Sivir ultimate, but it's going to probably have to be closest target. And then do you quite have the burst with only about 30% crit chance? Unlikely that you can take out someone as tanky as Watch, someone as tanky as Duke. And for now, KT just relegated to wave clear duty. Yeah, nice pushing from Najin. OQ still very strong. Uh, remember the bottom lane turret from Najin is about one hit away from dying, so that minion wave may do work. Actually, it looks like Najin's wave is pushing back out right now. It didn't quite hit, but the side wave's prepped, and that's going to be pretty much a free dragon for Najin. Just excellent position. You can see Pure in a pink water brush. Nothing KT can do. They're going to try and fast push down and get a bit of turret damage, but even then, not much they can do. So 2,000 gold, that's not really a decisive lead, but two turrets and two dragons. The neutral game, and remember, both these comps pretty mid-game focused, pretty turret-taking focused. Big advantage for Najin. KT, I agree. They, they've got to do something right now. They need to use the Sivir and the Annie to start getting picks, to start evening up this gold score. 
in terms of turrets because Dodgen is just pulling ahead on the objectives and they're not going to be getting much weaker. So someday trying to push through in the top side of the map, trying to get that tower down. They have to get these outers out of the way. And that bottom one should be the first priority because it is very, very low, and that's some easy, low-hanging fruit for them to go after. Most reliable way for KT to get a pick, of course, is to have Ward Supremacy and get someone to face check in any, someone to face check a Renekton. Both these champions are going to struggle to get big initiations in open areas when there's so much reposition. We've got the Thresh Lantern, of course, Corky has. He's going to go aggressive himself as I speak about him. Just get a bit of poke down. Because they're so far behind in map control, it feels like it's going to be so hard for someday to do what we know he's itemized for and get on top of a priority member with that Ruthless Predator. And he's still not able to bully out the opposition. Oh, Score just gets knocked around, has to flash out of that one. Zimmerolt used, and they're going to take out, actually, Okun going deep right there. He will pick up the kill on a Vixer, so one for one trade so far. Arrow, uh, he's just going to die, gets cornered right by the Wolves. And now OQ wants the Phosphorus Bomb. Can he finish it up with Rockets? Flash says yes with an auto. And that means three for one as KT tries to counter the engage of Najin, but falls very quickly. Najin now in firm control of this game. They should be able to get this turret with the Trinity Force Corky. The first 25 minutes have been all about OQ. Picked up the first two kills of the game for his team. Early Trinity Force now play the Ruin King. He's just got so much items, and they're fighting around his power spike super, super well. But KT, they haven't really drafted a team that can afford to wait out the Corky power spike. It feels like they wait much longer. It's not going to have the tools either in team comp or in resources left on the map to really be competitive. Najin has done such a good job of defending this bottom turret, though, so that KT can't get those resources, even though he's just been hanging by a thread the last hit has not come through, and that's helped Najin get more control over the Dragon consistently in this game, and that has been a major, major factor. As Fixer starts walking into the top side, KT just doesn't have any good place to put pressure right now. And if we dial it back and remember how this game went, so much of it was based on OQ getting the kill onto Someday. If that hadn't happened, that was basically the perfect thing for Najin. Corky gets into his power spike, goes back to the bottom lane, uses that advantage to shut down Arrow and Fixer. Meanwhile, Duke's ahead. Someday was behind from the death, and they were able to just leave Maokai alone in the top lane. And now KT really has very few answers. I'm sad to say that I don't feel like we're going to get a good answer about what exactly Renekton will contribute to a team comp. I mean, kind of the big word that sticks out for me is reliability. We all know what Maokai can do. There's a reason why you buy a catalyst, maybe a bit of magic resistant armor, and he kind of does his thing. He's very reliable. The thing that was reliable about Renekton a year ago was that his laning phase was just oppressive. You knew that he would bully around laning phase. He'd have pressure in top. Maybe you could invade with your jungler. You'd win 2v2 skirmishes. When you take away that reliable early game pressure to slightly improve what was always a traditionally weak late game, you're not going to have any sort of reliability in the late game, especially when you're behind. So if he's kind of a risky champion that can potentially snowball against a super reliable top laner, you kind of see why he's kind of fallen out of the meta. It's just there's better champions that can do better things in the late game. Hecarim, for example, stands out as a champion that also doesn't have the best of an early game. But man, what a late game. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. Is the... Is the late game buff to Renekton enough to justify this pick as opposed to a Hecarim, which kind of wants to accomplish the same thing in terms of damage? And I'm not sure that it is. I think I agree with you there, at least from what we've seen so far. Someday, he's going to clear out the wards right now. OQ playing very safe, gets a QSS. He says, well, there's an anti on the enemy team. I'm ahead. I can afford this item right now. And how does KT get back into this game? It's by killing OQ with Annie and Sivir, and that is much less likely to happen now. Looking like a tall order. And I guess just to complete the thoughts on champions at Renekton, there's a reason why the meta exists. It's because the champion picks that are popular are very reliable in accomplishing a goal. And when you take away the early game, Renekton doesn't really reliably accomplish anything. Yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, Black Cleaver's nice itemization. He's sitting happily on 20% plus cooldown reduction. He's building towards more magic resist. The Aegis that we talked about has been completed by score. It's just, as you mentioned, 
nobody on this team has any threat onto Oku. So even though he's not on the vein, which perhaps could have done even better in this scenario, he's still really happy. Yeah, and they because the Annie is the primary engage and Oku can just cleanse it and valk out, there's no other gap closer that they have. Renekton and, and Rek'Sai will be very easy to kite for this Corky. The one thing that you kind of have to bank on right now is that Edge gets some sort of ridiculous poke combo off on him and you're able to burst him down, but he's got lifesteal as well, so that makes it even harder to deal with. And Edge walking up to poke opens him up to poke from Oku himself, so that trade's going to be more reliable for Corky because he outranges quite significantly on the Rockets. So. Wow, this is Oku going super aggressive. He has the cleanse if he needs it, pops it. He's actually turning aggression onto Arrow. He's super low as well. Somebody's going to get into the back line. Oku just kiting this out. There's the explosive cast, and Someday finally finds Oku after he aggressively valked into that fight. Is Someday going to leave this alive, though? Goong has got him in his sights. There are the E. Flash forward, more twin fangs. That's going to be a kill for Goong. And then they just back out for the turret. I mean, Najin just doing a wonderful job of snowballing this game. It, it was really about that, that first blood and everything since that point has been Najin playing around the first blood and never giving KT a moment back in this one. This is such good shot calling from Najin. And it's one of those situations where the game was decided by an early move, but it didn't need to be. It's just that Najin understood what they had and played it. So we're going to see the replay. OQ kind of has one of his OQ moments. Goes very aggressive into Vixxer, doesn't even pick up the kill, then has to change target onto Arrow, who gets hooked. OQ will eventually go down, so someday finally gets his man. But it's a bit of a hollow victory. Yeah, it is, because everyone just piling through the choke right there. Doesn't matter if OQ goes down. He already forced the fight he needed to force right there. And they're able to pick up even more kills. Love that flash by Goong, by the way, for the finisher. So much movement speed, of course. Once he'd hit the Q, was understanding that he could get multiple Twin Fangs in if he flashed in. So, look, Goong's played a lot of Cassiopeia, four out of six of his last games. Clearly has Zion for that champion, despite what was a really poor performance against Jin Air last time out. Yeah, this time, turning it around in a very big way. And now Goong just going to take the blue buff. Both teams taking the enemy blue buff because Najin has been very bottom side and KT's been playing mostly top side this game as far as junglers are concerned. Bottom so side has opened them up three dragons though, Monty. That's probably the big advantage that we can say from playing the bottom side of the map and no true Baron pressure from KT. So let's play what item is someday building. Is he completing his maw right now? He is. Is the question. That would be It'd be very early for a Maw of Malmordius. Well, look, it'd be very late for a Tiamat, so we're going <laughs> to say it's going to be the Maw. It would be. Hey, Frozen Mallet. <laughs> I don't know about that one, once, Krista. I don't know about that one either, but I don't think that uh, finishing the ball right now is too great either. All right, KT looking for an angle right here. Uh, Najin has their... Mid pressure is set up already. They have the Trinity Force Corky. They're not going to commit to that, though. They want the fight instead. And he's going to back off to the Baron pit. KT does have some decent wards around the Baron right now. And Najin decides it's not the time. KT We're already have in the good, lead. They have We're a good, good wave good. push in bottom. Actually, they popped the ultimate. Yeah, I saw the recalls coming in, but that is a wasted Civil Roll right there. By the master of the Scuttle Crab himself. Well, they, I think that KT just has to try things at this point if they want to get back in. At long last, Papa Smithy, the bottom turret goes down. 32 minutes into this game, there's only the second turret for KT. It just means they have a deceptively large gold disadvantage. You might say, okay, it's only 3,500 gold, 32 minutes, not massive, but given their scaling, given the champion picks like the Renekton especially, Civ is usually a champion that has either a CS advantage or has a lot of assists or just is doing particularly well. Has 100% kill participation, but when there's only two of those, <laughs> not that great. Definitely not a lot of gold in the bank right now. Still, only about 3,000 up for Najin, so it's not out of reach for KT. It's just those dragons that are really going to start to oppress them right here. And the relatively weaker scaling overall. Well, let's see. Now they can do Najin now, trying to get in onto this Baron, but there's a large ring of wards around that objective that KT have managed to lay down. Some of them even deep right there, even if they don't have eyes on the Baron itself. Score looks for an angle. Watch just going to body slam out. 
And this is something that Najin should understand. Given that they've been playing around the bottom side of the map, given that they know that they've been trading blue buffs consistently, the one thing KT has achieved in 33 minutes is solid ward control and general control around the top side of the map. The crucial factor there is that despite all of that, of course they didn't really have any Baron threat, and they haven't even snowboarded a big CS oh. match for the top lane. Score gets the unburrow, but Lantern's available. Such defensive play from Najin. They seem to have an answer every time to when KT wants to play aggressively, when they want to go on the attack. And they've avoided the Civil They've avoided the Annie stun. These are the crucial things that could lead to picks. And then a big Baron play right now. Dragon number four coming up in under two minutes. No one has wards down there, but with Najin's big recall, this is their time to set up and just continue to pressure that Dragon score. Gonna get hooked, they're actually going in, OQ, gonna Valk forward onto that watch there as well, score over the wall, flashes, and oh, that was a very bad explosive cask from watch. He could have finished that kill. The early season Gragas mechanics elude him for a little bit there, watch, so they don't pick up the kill and do expend the summoner and important team fight ultimate. He just plopped it down right in front of him, but it was after score had flashed, so he 100% had time to hit that ultimate. Just a misplay. It was a very right shallow there. barrel. <laughs> a shallow barrel. Yep. barrel. Reminds me of when you flash Fizz ultimate and it just kind of plops out at your feet. <laughs> that, is, that is truly sad. Very depressing. Goong finishes Death Cap. I believe he has his third evolution of his passives. That's 700 AP already and avoid stuff. So he's feeling pretty comfortable. He doesn't quite have the QSS, but with the effective health from the Seraphs, even he is going to be quite hard to DPS down as a mid range mage. Yeah, and he's been following up as well on more aggressive plays by his teammates. I mean, OQ can just Valk in all he wants right now, honestly, and Goong will just clean up the fight. OQ. Taking a nice chunk of farm down at this bot lane. Someday, uh, that's free. Should bear Now they see OQ on the bottom side. KT, they've got to do this to get back into this game. This is the right call given the circumstances. Someday getting low right now. They're going to go on to Duke right, but so much damage coming through from Najin. Can they pursue pure? Nobody's onto him yet. Someday we'll take that kill. Goom with the Renekton in the back. Goom gonna flash backwards. Has Twin Fangs down. Chilling Smite onto Goom. Score gonna hunt him down. Is he? No. Summoner heal from OQ will save him in the end. And that is two kills, or one kill for three, rather, in favor of Najin. But you know what, Papa? I think you, they had to go for it. That was their shot back into this game. And the team fight was looking excellent, especially because Sunday did turn the pickaxe into a Hydra. So he had so much damage without OQ there to DPS him down. They were looking pretty good, but of course, OQ rotated, has so much mobility. Easy Baron for Najin to pick up. And as you mentioned, if they didn't make that play, it just felt like the overwhelming pressure of this game would have won Nudge in the game anyway. Right. I mean, you have to look at the circumstances when teams make decisions about that. Yeah, because you could say, well, that was a dumb Baron. And it was kind of a dumb Baron as we look at it, but it was the only shot they had. That was a really good explosive cast from Watch, by the way, into the combo. So watch how much damage Someday is doing in an AoE with the Ravenous Hydra complete. Goon eventually able to flash and kite him away, of course, gets a lot of movement speed from the queue, and that's when OQ shows up, and man, this guy has a lot of damage. Yeah, he certainly does, and that's gonna be Dragon number four, so. As I was saying, you, when teams make decisions like this, you're a KT, you're very far behind, you know you're not gonna be winning these team fights in a 5v5 situation. You see that Dragon number four is nearly up, and you know you can't fight it. So if OQ shows on that bottom side and gives you a glimmer of a chance to take that Baron or to force a 5v4 fight with all your CC and your speed, you have to go for it. So I think KT absolutely made the right call. It's just too little too late. And they have a massive amount of burst damage. If they can get two, three members before OQ groups, remember, OQ's got sitting on 10,000 plus gold worth of items. The goalie doesn't mean much if it's a true 5v4. They tried to force it, didn't quite get the engage they needed. Now they're watching as multiple things go that, against them. It's going to be the turret, not quite the inhibitor yet, but Najin, they're such a tanky frontline for OQ to free damage behind. I'm just really impressed by Najin this game, Papa, because they haven't shown this level of competency at shot calling. And when we talk about Najin, normally we say things like, wow, look at how good individually all their players are. but and they're, oh, 
What the? Oku walks up to a full damage Renekton and has to flash away. That was a bit of another OQ moment. First one baited in a good engage. Might still get one here, but we see the re-engage. Well, I mean, KT has to go for it. They already chunked out the AD carry. They've got nothing to lose in that situation. Wow, OQ, you know? I thought he was over the OQ moment. He didn't die right there, but he's had a few very strange Valkyries this game. Remember, he's moved over to a champion with an 800 range escape, so maybe he can get away with more OQ moments with QSS and the Valkyrie available. They still get the turret profiting from some questionable maneuvers. Yeah, there's a hook onto Someday right into the W from Renekton. Can they finish him off? No, Someday just takes down Pure to about 20% HP. Draws out the Mikhail's, which is a three minute cooldown. Again, these small victories, they might have meant something 20 minutes ago, but given how far Najin is ahead in the objective game, a game that KT opted into with this mid game comp, this is not much they can do. No, it's not. But like I was saying, Najin, we talk about these guys, we say, look at how good they are in lane. Duke, Oki, so lane dominant. Goon, capable of snowballing off of a few kills. But we don't think of them as having very clean shot calling or snowballing, sometimes making very critical late game mistakes. But Najin, this game has been incredibly clean. And this is what you want to see from a snowball. How tiny of an advantage uh, can a team take and then use it to win the game? And Najin's case, it was the first blood we talked about going in here. Who's going to get ahead? Is it going to be OQ or Someday? Because that's going to have a very large effect on who can carry the game. This time, it was like a perfect dream setup. OQ gets the first blood onto Someday, and it's just been a massive snowball accruing from Najin since that point. And in many ways, Najin is emulating the performance that Jin Air showed us two days ago against Najin and really blew Najin away when they were on a four-game winning streak. Najin just didn't get much done that series. Watched as a better team when it came to rotations and early play. Blew them away in, in the early game and stacked objectives. Look here, 40 minutes into the game, six turrets down, four dragons to zero. Very Jyn esque in how they've played out this game. And I think KT has to deny the Gragas in the next game because Watch has been a major factor. Watch here, in fact, may have an MVP performance, honestly, because of how hard he's been able to shut down with his jungle pressure. And now they looking to wrap around the top side turret. Duke on mid lane clearing duties, but someone's going to have to go back for these super minions, and that mid inhibitor turret is quite low. Yeah. So much damage, and of course the Trinity Force Prox means they will be able to take down that objective. Watch after Gragas goes to Evelyn and potentially Cinder Hulk Lee Sin. Definitely not places of power compared to Gragas in this meta. So another inhibitor will fall for Najin EM Fire as they set their sights on the last tier two turret that KT has in this game. Should be quite simple. Renekton's drawn to dealing with the super minions and bots, so this is by far the safest objective for them to pick up. Fifth dragon spawning in a minute and a half, Baron in a minute 45. KT, they might dream about forcing some sort of trade between those two objectives, but given the fact that they've had no time to put down any wards in the area, it's a bit of a pipe dream. Yeah, it is. And, but nobody can take the lantern. Pure just stood there for a long time for no reason. Oh, Q. Says, I've got my own movement ability here. Valk's out. Picks up an infinity edge. He could have gone for the Mercurial <laughs> Scimitar and a bit more defense. No. That's not the OQ no. way. <laughs> could have picked up, you know, a Bloodthirster for increased safety, perhaps against this high damage Renekton, maybe getting a little bit of a shield. But I like it. Just That's why I think OQ is fun to watch. Balls of steel. You know how it's. It, you know how you get the most safe as an AD carry. You kill all the enemies, and then you're really safe. The best. The best defense is a good offense. That that scenario, right? Do you subscribe to that philosophy of League of Legends? I believe that is the title of the music video of OQ's career. <laughs> I, th I thought it was just the title of the LPL, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> can't disagree with that. All right. So Najin here, just waiting very patiently. This is going to be the apocalyptic final battle that KT has to fight in a, if they want to have a pipe, even a pipe dream of winning this game, unless they want to try and trade for Baron. But OQ can just solo the Dragon right now while the rest of his team threatens Baron out of the mid lane. We'll see where Najin go. They're trying to create as much pressure as possible around this choke. KT knows the Dragon is spawning. Just now is live. 
This is Cassiopeia and has six item broken. You know that this dragon's gonna die quick. And there's Watch comes in. There it is, number five. And the battle begins immediately. Fixer falls almost instantaneously. Someday tries to get to the back line. OQ and just has too much damage and takes him out through some kiting score. Finds himself in the middle of four for a double kill for the OQ. And now Duke does not teleport duty into the base. There is Someday on your screen right now. Not looking too happy about how this game has gone, but what incredible shot calling from Nodge in this game. That is really the major factor. And this should be the easy push to a win. A surrender, actually, for KT Rollster. They're done with this one. They want to move on to game two. And it's a significant thing that Naj and EM Fire's cleanest victory of the season is against a team like KT, who's right there with the same exact record. They obviously examined what brought them down against Jin Air, but played such a controlled style. They always had the pressure on the bottom side of the map, and monopolizing Dragon brought them a lot of the advantages that allowed them to close out a very comfortable victory. And now, it's going to be about that adaptation, right? Because even though KT got some comfort picks like that Sivir, they tried to go for the Renekton, maybe a little bit questionable in terms of their ability to really get someday into a place to carry. But uh, not just some decent performances in other champions, but with such a top-heavy champion pool, They've obviously gone for the gambit, throwing their young player to the walls. First game, it's not like he was shocking. He just couldn't get it done in a high-pressure environment. And interestingly, we have an anti-ban, actually, from KT. Now that they are on that blue side, you mentioned those anti statistics. That's another loss for anti, actually, that last game. But still a very overwhelming 70-plus per percent win ratio within champions here in Korea. Kalista, the first ban on the red side. Given that poke and control mages have been so popular, and he's one of the few ways to deal with it, especially from the support position. And wow, we're going really deep on the support bands. Only an Alistair really looms one of those real top tier supports. Imagine, are they going to ban the rise themselves? They were suckered into picking it in the match against Jyn Air, and it really didn't work. Have they learned how to shut it down on their own? And it's actually Najin that will ban the Gragas. Interesting to see where Rek'Sai falls in the party. We've seen first pick Rek'Sai's come out in a couple of series. And suddenly, if you lock in Rek'Sai on KT, what does Watch have left? Maybe even the Lee Sin. Such as Jyn Air against Najin in the last yep. match. They really showed how powerful that Rek'Sai can be with a good jungler against Najin EM Fire. And there's the Alistair. So it looks like they are setting themselves up for that first pick Rise or the first pick Rek'Sai. Najin could leave Rise up again and think that they're going to get it in the first round of the draft on the red side. Three bans against Pure. Mentioned already, eight and six games respectively on the Alistair and the Nautilus. Of course, we saw Annie, I believe, for the second time come through from this team. So, going to also be extended champion pools in the support role. The Rise auto ban comes through. Rek'Sai first pick, Looms is a very popular choice. That has to be it, I think, for KT. They must have been watching those Jin Air games, saw the weakness that Watch had when he was forced onto a tertiary pick like Evelyn, and there it is. So KT going to emulate Jin Air's draft from the blue side and see if they can put Watch in a similar situation where he's not able to hard carry the game to the same degree he did last time. My guess is Lee Sin, because that's the one champion where you can hard carry the early game and then go more to the peel star that we saw when we were watching the replays of Watch's MVP performance in game one. Gonna flash the Echo, jungle Echo, Echo in the mid. Hasn't had a lot of success so far in Champions. No, it's it definitely hasn't been a big pickup here in Korea. Of course, some players have had some pretty good experiences with it in the West. And let's say the word yet when we talk about the picks. Yeah. This champion does so much that I'm sure Echo will really push out as a top pick. But for now, teams just haven't really worked either playing around him or even really mastering which role is optimal for this champion. Duke going with the early rumble this time around. That is a champion that fell all the way through picks and bans in the last game, despite being very popular here in the Korean scene. And Watch is going to go on that Evelyn again. Now, he was found out very easily with the Tremor Sense my chaser, how smart is score going to be with his pathing in this game? Do they have a plan to deal with watches Evelyn like Jin Air did? I think you also want to prioritize some semblance of a pick support. Now, 
Awkwardly, you've banned out three of them, KT. But I feel like Thresh might be the pick here, just so that you have something that can easily roam into mid, just like we see so often from Snowflower, and add pick pressure, because you have so much extra information about Evelyn when you have the Tremor Sense. So pick initiation from support could be powerful. Fixer also an excellent Thresh player, uh, one of the best in Korea. So taking something like that could be noteworthy. The Azir was banned last game by Najin. And she may just want to go for the victor one more time, but that probably just means that Goon's going to play Cassiopeia again. And Arrow, interestingly, moving away from the Sivir and onto an early pick Corky. I don't... I understand the victor. The, the Corky pick here is a bit questionable. It's actually a shocking time to decrease your Sivir priority because Sivir's so wonderful against Rumble. That quick burst of speed gets you away from multiple ticks of the Equalizer. It's one of the champions that often answers an early Rumble pick or complements an early Rumble pick. But in this situation, freely open to OQ. Maybe they'll actually keep their AD carry position for last and then try and see if it's safe times for Vayne. But so far, we're waiting to see. They're flashing the Xerath, but only GBM really confident enough to go with that pick. No, I think that definitely here, you go for the Thrash, you take that again for pure, you take the Sivir, or you just uh, you grab a mid laner right now, Cassiopeia, and then go for that Vayne last, the old Najin special this season. But they're going to lock in the Sivir and the Thresh. So what exactly is Fixer going to be playing here? The big pick, of course, he's played commonly, but specifically against Corky was, of course, the Braum, which he still has a 2 and one record on. Very unique in the Braum picking. Dirty Braum picker, I believe, we've leveled against him. I believe it's, is it 5.11 or 5.12 that slight Braum buffs come through? I believe that's 5.12. Might be. I'm not 100% clear. I believe you're right in that case. But Brom still, look, he's not a laning champion, but can do some interesting things in the team fight. I don't really like it in this particular comp, but it's definitely the champion that Fixer's played the most that's, that's actually still available this draft. So, Maokai, some days most played champion so far this season, has a very good win rate on it. Fixer maybe defaulting to some peel right here with the Janna. And that means that Score and Edge are going to have a lot of time just to poke from the back line. And that'll be how they want to play out these team fights. Oh my, here we go again. Okay. Now, Renekton can mess up a Rumble. He, that is a very good 1v1 lane matchup, reminiscent of the River matchup. But of course, itemizing more on the tanky side, usually, although from, yet, from the previous game, definitely was focusing on damage. Can they actually play around it? Because notably, despite having a pretty good 1v1 matchup, we did not see score path around Someday very much. Or even in the game against SKT, when we saw Someday break out the Riven, we still wasn't seeing score path around the favorable 1v1 top lane matchups. Also, KT here is really committing to kiting. They don't have any form of primary engage whatsoever. You're going to have to get pretty lucky to get in slice and dice range. Speaking of kiting. Yeah, and I think that something like a poke champion would be very good for Najin right here if they can get it off. But instead, they're going to play the Cassiopeia, also a great champion for kiting. Najin with the engage. Watch has to be there with the flanks in order to make this work. But KT, they can't fight if they get behind in this game, and Najin has a position on a Dragon or Baron, they do not have any tools for engage whatsoever. They are entirely reliant on Najin coming to them. And after having a perfect game, Najin, in terms of the Dragon, 5-0, and oh, Katie still opt into a comp that really needs to get an objective snowball and force the enemy to come to them. You talked about the fact that Watch could be initiated. You can just use that ult for disengage. Both these teams can play the disengage game. So the critical factor, what we're both looking for, whoever can get control of the neutrals, whether it's the outer turrets or specifically the dragon, should have a massive compositional advantage against the enemy. The thing is, at least Najin can engage. They have Sivir, they have Evelyn flanks, they have the equalizer to start off these fights. KT has nothing. Best case scenario, it's like, Flash, Slice and Dice, W, or Flash on Burrow is Rek'Sai. That's it. Those are the only tools. So I'm very wary of this KT composition. They have to get that lead. Najin at least has a bit more flexibility. And someday, he needs to make this Renekton pick work. He needs to make us believers. It should win the 1v1 matchup, and maybe the top lane pressure will be enough to parlay everything else. All right, let's get into game two. KT versus Najin.
Well, Nachin up 1-0 here in this game. As we get into game two, KT really wants to get into this one. Oh wow, we have an entire sentence being written here. Where's Chobra when you need him? <laughs> So Renekton. So Renekton. We know what he does. Although he was toned down a bit in the laning phase, we're expecting Duke to build primarily for the equalizer, primarily in terms of magic penetration, maybe work towards Azania slowly. But this should be a laning matchup that Someday excels in. Weirdly, though, we've seen Someday pick the Riven into Rumble. We've seen Someday now pick the Renekton into Rumble. Both those games. Score hasn't been pathing around someday very much in the last few series, despite picking what is on paper excellent laning matchups. Yeah, good gank. Well, it was a bit of a lane swap in that last one. And, you know, now we are we going to see standard lanes look like Thresh and Sivir heading up to the top side. So if Najin can dodge standard lanes again, that just like last time is going to be a pretty strong advantage for them. The main difference this game is that Arrow is on Corky, so at least if he gets that solo XP, he'll have that earlier power spike, which he was lacking in the last one. And someday just gonna go after the Raptors here after scraping his blade against the ground incessantly, and Oki will freeze. The 13 minute Trinity Force bore all the advantages Najin needed to get the dragons to really take over the bottom side of the map that was what got them their big victory. So that's what Carol will be trying to emulate. Actually, OQ walking up to the blue buff as well. He wanted to see what was going on. They played very aggressively. Going to lose some CS as a result of that movement, however. And Duke and Watch not really penalized. Pure is just going to walk in circles right now until his trinket ward comes up. Pop it right down next to the blue buff. Isolated mid lane matchup, exact same one. Goon ran away from it, but it was mostly a non factor between these two mid lanes. The game was played around mid lane last time out. Uh, KT knows there's not going to be anything in this top side. A fixer may have gotten eyes on the Gromp, so they're just going to go do that as we speak. Still a blue buff right there. It's being pinged by Najin at the moment, so they know there's a chance to three buff. Again, KT thinking that there may be a port from Duke, but Duke just not going down into that lane, of course, for the second game in a row. They're gonna wait on this. Someday, back at base right now, going down to the bottom side. We could see a lane swap here, depending on how much damage can get down onto this turret. Still a freeze from OQ and top. So because KT actually got to lane late, remember we saw them taking a journey over to the blue buff. Freezing wasn't as much of an option. It was always going to push either slow or fast. It wasn't going to be perfectly frozen like Sivir was able to push up and top. So what they've managed to do is go for the fast push around it. Evelyn and Thresh certainly provide, won't provide too much. In fact, drawing out Rumble's teleport to try and keep this turret up. Well, they know it's a 3v3 right now. Arrow taking a pot shot at Pure. Pure still level 1. 4v3 into the turret. What are they doing? Score just gives up first blood. What was that? Yeah. That was curious, Monte Cristo. That was quite curious indeed. Very unnecessary death right there for Score. And, you know, they what they were trying to do in this was to get Someday into lane against Duke. But it didn't work. And now watch here on the bottom side. Ooh, taking a look for this gank right now. Going to be seen by Someday, so he's not going to actually get any damage off. But... The, the entire thing, KT, what they wanted to do. So we saw Someday Recall. That means that Score is sitting at that turret to help proxy the wave so they can reverse it so that Someday will have a long lane to play against Duke in and use that Renekton advantage. Instead, Score gets caught under the turret and dies, and therefore that advantage kind of just evaporates. And two games in a row, this is what's happened in the early game. Remember in the previous game, Oku got the solo kill onto Someday to really set behind Someday, entered lane against Maokai, even or behind in both experience and items, notably only had a Doran Blade after his first back. In this situation, Oku's able to freeze top, get solo experience and gold, and gold once again is donated over to Najin. So early game rotations and play from KT. First, almost getting three buffed multiple games and then just dying unnecessarily. 
it's not really what we expected from a team that at the start of the season, honestly, was one of the best at executing both the early game and the rotational game. Yeah, it's been a bit of a fall for them, certainly. But by that token, too, Najin has been pretty consistently on the rise since they've stuck to this one roster. You can really see the synergy developing between the players. Edge getting poked out here by Goon. Goon just having a field day in that mid lane. Score may be coming for a gank right here, but not sure Edge is going to be able to really follow up on that. He is highly poisoned right now and doesn't have a death ray. Despite this being a battle for they four watch spot, is there. score is coming through, gets the chilling smite on Burrow as well. Will there be enough damage? It hits level six very low, flashes away though. Watch is very squishy but gets away as well. Najin managed to make the evasive maneuvers and no one dies in mid. No, nobody dies. Goog has to burn his flash. So no summoners expended by KT Rolster. That ultimate for ultimate and that means that there's going to be some denial here in the mid lane, depending on how much CS Watch wants to take at this point in time. But OQ, again, very far ahead. The side lane so in favor of Najini Empire. And when you make a lane swap like that after the minion waves are have gone down, you're, you're just going to miss some CS. That's it. You, you have to take that penalty if you want to go back to standard lanes after starting out in the swap. Absolutely, as Someday once again has a CS disadvantage, so both carries quite a long way behind their uh, opposite numbers, despite the tender age, seven minutes only into this game. If Najin go on to win this series, Monte Cristo, they would have lost three games. Notably, they'll finish fourth in terms of this half of the season, only having lost to the likes of Anarchy in the first series, which was a bit of an aberration, it was the first series, and then you're going to talk about losses to SKT and Jenner, of course, so honestly, that's really good reading if you're a Najin fan. Yeah, and especially this team that had such a poor showing in the spring season, the most frustrating team easily because of their amount of talent on paper that you really had to feel. If you're a Najin fan was not being used optional, optimally with all of the roster swaps and uh, you know the, the promising players not being used in a lot of the games, and as well as OQ's individual performance being rocky, sometimes showing some incredible highs, but also some very, uh, very questionable plays at times that cost his team either finishing a game quickly or entire games, period. Uh, and now everything seems to be evening out where they're finally able to grow and really start to live up to their potential. And look, Oku did encapsulate that reputation with some rocky moments in the previous game, but crucially, the, the macro play was actually really good, and despite the fact that, once again, their lanes were winning, which has kind of been something they've always been pretty good at, the laning phase, because they've been playing the macro side of the game well as well, even with the slight brain fades, it didn't make a sizable difference in the game. You know, I'm a bit questionable about that too, because even that one time that OQ kind of valked in and then had to back off with the lantern, he knew the lantern was there, and actually that aggressive move kind of sucked KT in into continuing that fight, which ended up very poorly for them. So Edge here gonna get petrifying gaze. There's the slow. Shield comes in from Jana Goong. A little bit low. Flash forward for Edge, and there's the tornado. Goodbye, Goong. Edge with the kill. But the roam from Fixer is the true MVP. What wonderful timing and edge. Look, he could have been defensive, he could have just gotten out, but understood that with the exhaust and the flash available, there was real kill pressure onto Goong. So he wondered, especially after an objectively poor display in game one, could Edge make it work under the lights in front of a big crowd? But he's done really well. Yep, turning that around, and they knew the flash was down from Goong also, so yet another reason oh. to gank that. What? <laughs> <laughs> so scratch that last comment. The wow. overstay against Evelyn. Wow, that is rookie rookie error right there for sure. Not respecting a professional jungler on Evelyn can, of course, naturally have its downsides. Watch just using his flash and his ultimate to kill him. Someday wants the turret kill. There's the equalizer. It goes down, but Duke in a bit of trouble. Has to be lanterned away as the tides are turned by score and fixer for KT. So first turret. Why would you replay. why would you recall right there? Very aggressive recall. That's a solo Q <laughs> recall right there. Steps away from the safety of his own turret. You know he was in the shop as well. I'm going to get a big item by him. Feeling pretty. Oh. <laughs> Look at this sick advantage I have on Goong. All right. Let's go for it. Well, Edge got a 
dot your I's and cross your T's there, little 17-year-old buddy. Very, very tender age, 17 and a half, so. Doesn't it make you, we were talking about this before the cast. Oh, Fixer actually gonna get hooked right there. Shield down, Fixer going to be taking a visit to the black and white screen. Something his compatriot Edge is obviously very known about. In the wow. bottom lane, though, they're getting on to Duke. No equalizer available. We saw it used a moment ago. Renekton certainly does very good damage. You have to worry if you score, but confident enough, and they pick up the kill. Yeah, just the Dominus right there enough. Watch going to respond with a blue buff on the opposite side of the map. OQ still with the lane dominant CS score right now. Has that Avarice Blade to keep on snowballing it also. So pure visits there for a couple of Relic Shield procs, get some gold under your support, and then back off. So this game, much more interesting. Teams answering each other tit for tat, successful ganks from both sides. OQ is the big benefactor, both of the early freeze, so his experience is able to pick up solo experience in the early game, but the Avarice by compounding the lead. Definitely a snowball item choice. We see that Hedgefine Gaze once again is going to be 2v2. Edge is quite zoned out of this fight. Watch has a lot of health. Looks like no kills to be picked Ooh, up. And Pure there waiting in the black, seeing if he can get a follow-up death sentence and turn it around. Score and Edge not going to commit to that when they have inadequate vision on the lower side of the river. Goong didn't have to use his flash right there either. It's another benefit of that situation for him. And there's Goon going in. Edge just finds himself all alone. There is no vision for him. And Goon with an all-in. Doesn't even have to flash for it. Edge just coming undone here a little bit in this game. That He's not making very good decisions. Yeah, they're unforced errors. He did not have the defensive vision to be pushed up more than halfway up his lane against a high damage mid lane like Cassiopeia. His dying, of course, relieves any pressure of taking this early dragon. And the dragon snowball was 5-0 in the first game. It's going to be 1-0 to Najin here. Yeah, and that, you just can't make those kind of errors because he knew going into that situation that he didn't have flash, Goong did. So playing aggressively at all carries its risk. And score was on the opposite side of the map, but he had already left trying to get some wards into the top side jungle, and that's a very bad decision from Edge. So I really like the re-engage re and aggression to pick up his first kill, Edge, but dying quickly to Evelyn afterwards, and now dying to give up an objective. In fact, a couple of objectives over to Najin could have started a snowball very early in this game. Yeah, they, there, are still some, there are still some advantages, though. This time, Someday does have the kill. Tower advantage to KT also, which they can continue to pile on because there's only that one turret left, and they have Quarky and Victor. Great poke, great siege as we enter the mid game. They can get that outer ring down and then regain control of the dragon, but one sad fact of tonight at this point is that KT has yet to get a single dragon in these two games. Yeah, 6-0 is the dragon score. Arrow doesn't have the Trinity Force. This is, of course, the timing when OQ, with his two kills, had already picked up Trinity Force. So we'll have quite the turret killing pressure just yet. In fact, this is going to go farm in an open lane. So not going to be even threatening any objectives on Corky around the 15-minute mark. Najin rotating a lot of members top. They want to break this top lane, and they want to do it right now. They want to force the dive here if possible. Score is waiting to turn something around if he can. Someday's actually just going to get hooked and blown up. Dominus goes down. That's going to be a finisher on top of the equalizer. So Someday just walking forward into the enemy team. A lot of disrespect gets hit by the death sentence. I don't know why you would walk forward like that. Seems like KT just not playing well around these turrets today. Something is off in their communication. Score giving up that first blood very awkwardly. And now Someday not I mean, that was, you don't walk up right there. I mean, who's walked up so far this game? Let's actually just take stock of it. Score, edge twice, and now someday, all just playing disrespectful, not safe, not having vision, and even having a lot of immediate threat. For score, it was the turret in a very early turret push. For someday, it was four members of the enemy team. Unforced errors is really the only way I can put it. Uh, they're really making it easy for Najin, actually. There's not much to Najin's playmaking ability this game, honestly, because they're getting these these breaks in terms of who is walking forward, who is recalling in, in very poor locations. Now they're taking advantage of it, and that's led them to a lead, but oh, Fixer going to try and make a pick on a pure right here. Lantern is down. He's got a flash. Had his flash available, so he won't be guilty of the aggressive walk-ups that uh, KT have been able to do. 
Some days free farming in bot top. We see the same story with Duke in bottom. Still waiting to be made a believer of the Renekton, though. I think uh, we're going to be waiting a long time, Bob Smithy. Well, we might not see the Renekton again. Maybe uh, Jenner will play Yasuo again in the next match, and we can have Head Scratcher pick Knight. But you can just get a uh, Doran Shield, and you're immune to Cassiopeia damage, right? <laughs> I, I hear that's true. You know, it's a, it's a good lane matchup, honestly, Yasuo versus Cassiopeia. You could block her from getting a lot of twin fangs down on you, but outside of that lane, that's where things get a bit dicey. Yeah, Janair going to the meta certainly is a major proponent there, Ryan. Though, of course, we'll talk a lot more about that in Series 2, which, you know, with all the mistakes from KT, might not be far away. Yeah. I'm, I'm very surprised to see the Najin we're seeing tonight after the, those Jadair games because they looked just absolutely destroyed that day by Jadair. Didn't really look like they were doing much at all, had no pressure, had no control of the tempo, but Najin just making KT march to the beat of their drum this evening. It looks like an entirely different team. Just watching the CS fires and items. No real massive pickups. Trinity Force from Arrow, though, is quite a significant one. It's a couple of minutes later. Then Oki was able to pick it up in game one, but that's just purely by virtue of being the only member of both teams to not have a score involvement. But you have this Corky, and you have a Sivir who is knocking on the door of an Infinity Edge right now. Average that... Blade probably about 300 gold as well by this point. Yeah, so you have to be worried that this Power Spike timing window is quickly shrinking. And now more pressure onto Edge. That just both summoners, though. Worth knowing that with the build that the Renekton has been going, you know, we saw more Malmordius and the early magic resist in general last game. Because you're not going to have a high health pool, can actually sit on the equalizer for quite a long time because he's purely itemized magic resist. Maybe he'll be able to do consistent damage in the front, tussle up with the Sivos, always had trouble dealing with his big tanks, especially in the early game, and prove the point. He's actually very low on the map, but that's only because he's taking Grom. And uh, there we go. Hook lands, but. No real follow-up, Goon, level 11, but not wanting to commit with his ultimate. So this is the bad part. We talked about the lack of engage on KT. Mm -hmm. They have to have the early position on this dragon. They're getting it this time, they are. Uh, we see that bottom wave since they pushed it up. KT must be in this position to contest the dragon. They have to have Najin come to them. That's why I expect Duke to use a teleport early. Something Marin likes to do is just teleport to a turret rather than trying to be impactful with the teleport as if he was a teleport home guard, Maokai or Hecarim. The other option, just group with your team early. Be there five members to be able to take vision. As you mentioned, if Najin have vision control, Katie just have no way to force anything. Well, they've let Najin into the river right now. They fell back just a tad, and now Najin getting their own wards up. Pink ward in the brush. Crab to the side of KT, but the dragon has spawned, and KT doesn't have a good way to engage this unless they make a pick. Watch is going to be seen with the tremor sense. Trying to zone out Okio, could just walk around, though. Edge has 1,400 gold in the bank. Arrow has 1,200. a lot of unspent gold, whereas Duke went back and bought a Leandri. So this equalizer is going to be doing a lot of damage. No Aegis completed yet. Definitely more optimum shots coming through for Najin. So if KT can kind of delay out this dragon, go back, spend their gold, they'll definitely be a team fight around dragon that can look to fight on fairly equal footing. But for now, they're actually more just committing to the split push. Well, they have control over the side waves. That's how KT wants to play this one. Did you die a little? I did. From all your casting. Duke just going to clear waves in top. Watching the vision game. There's a nice pink ward onto Dragon. Just going to be cleared out and just vision creation and deletion. Basically been the story of the last couple of minutes. This Dragon has just sat idly. Yes, it has. So interesting that Najin doesn't really want to commit to this. I feel they have that big advantage. And look at all that gold onto Edge in the mid lane, he doesn't really have much to fight with right now. Najin certainly could be taking this in a very good position. And remember, if we do see a team fight, when you're sitting on 1,800 gold and your team's 2,000 behind, that's an effective 3,800 gold advantage from Najin, purely just because of bad shopping times for Edge. Uh, he does seem to be getting exposed in this series for being a, a rookie player. Not having that same level of foresight. 
as a lot of the veterans in this game. Hajin should start the Dragon. They move that minion wave. Pure instead is just getting chunked out. Takes his Phosphorus Bomb, Trinity Force proc from Corky and moves away with his tail between his legs. Now maybe he needs to go shop. Does this open time for Edge to get his massive shop in? Has Neil's a large rod and then some if he chooses to back. They don't have vision of him though. This is not the time to shop. Side waves are pushing forward. He cannot go back right now. They're gonna try and steal, can score, get it. He's gonna go under the wall, pure. And actually, Edge just gets hit by a massive equalizer right in the choke, flash forward from Goong. And there you go, Twin Fang follow up. Watch gets over the wall, hits the Agony's Embrace, and now more poke just going into that choke point. Najin unable, oh actually they did get the Dragon right there, and now they're gonna re-engage someday, slicing and dicing out, and there we go, score with the flash, unburrow, arrow, finds himself right in the sights of Duke and OQ. Duke picks up the kill, and now they're going to go back into the mid lane, and that's it, you see how many flashes had to be used, scores had to flash unburrow. And to some get degree, back into that fight. And some degree, Najin open themselves up for the re-engage, understand they still have the more powerful item timings. They still win three for two of the trade after taking the second dragon. Still a dragon shutout 20 minutes into game two of the series for Najin. Yeah, and that dragon, look at how methodical it was. Najin playing a very safe game here, waiting until they had the side wave control then going in on it. You have to wonder why Edge is the one walking up to the unwarded brush. He was the one most aggressively positioned. It's a very nice flash ult from Evelyn. They could have just backed away. If they'd already picked up a kill, they'd already picked up the objective. But at this point, they choose to ring gauge. They hit the death centers and then leads to the flash on bar. You can see, you mentioned flash has been used. Everything has been used here by KT and they still lose the engage and also the dragon. Yeah, Duke getting very scary in this game. Infinity Edge Static Shiv completed for OQ here at the 22 minute mark. And now the game is really going to start tilting in favor of Najin. They have the control over Dragon yet again. And KT has failed to get the lanes right in the early game. And they are now at a deficit as a result. And it's two series in a row where I think picking favorable lane matchups for Someday and not empowering him to either split push or ganking his lane in favorable matchups is costing KT. What is the point of a Renekton who's 35 CS behind Rumble, who's always going to be a superior team fighter? No defensive vision for someday to overextend on the Renekton, just like there was no defensive vision for him to play aggressive against Marin's Rumble when he was playing the Riven that game. What is someday to do, and why are they picking these lane dominant champs if they're not willing to comp or play around them? Well, it's also an issue of. They usually do play around someday. Exactly. So what is going on tonight where that priority has just gone downhill? I think that they thought they were to get the 1v1 or the 2v2, the standard lanes in these games, and then they had a game plan for that. But they played the lane swaps very poorly, given up first blood both times rather needlessly in a lane swap situation. I mean, especially this game where Score yeah. walked up, terrible. got flayed, and died under turret for no reason at all while the freeze was on and topped by OQ. Just Losing in both sides of the map, unforced, was uh, a big problem. A lot of errors from KT Rolster in this series. Uh, you're not going to take that away from Najin, though, who has, I think, come in tonight with a very clear game plan, honestly, and just absolutely vice-like control over the Dragon Pit at the bottom side of the map. It'd be quite a statement of intent if Najin could win a two-game series and never give up a single uh, dragon to KT and not even have paid for it in anything. They're ahead in kills, they're even in turrets. It's not like they're trading dragon control for something else in either of these games. And that just says so much about Najin as a team too and their evolution as shot callers over the course of this season from the solo queue train wreck of spring to this level of patience and map pressure. And it reminds me a lot more of the old Najin shield roster which would win with those sideway pushes and the super minion pushes would just avoid fighting you forever. And all Najin fans are going to take away from that statement is, is it time for Najin to make their triumphant <laughs> re-re-re-return to Worlds? <laughs> oh boy, you watch is destined. You can't stop him. You just cannot stop watch from attending Worlds. Someone put that guy on a flight list. That's the only way. Uh, of course, KT 
having never been to Worlds. <laughs> Much to your chagrin, of course. Well, it's, you know, KT, they, they tend to show up big in the summer season, and yet the spot at Worlds continues to elude them. Okay. Arrows, bullets, nobody I, can make it. I'm used to it, Papa Smithy. I live a life of disappointment as a CLG and KT fan. Man, <laughs> the eternal <laughs> suffering of Monte Cristo. Not what I expected to be your biography title. But with those two teams, man. At least you, you liked Samsung before it was cool, and, and then they got good. <laughs> yeah, I was the hipster Samsung Blue fan that was like, wow, there's two GSG guys in this lineup. Actually, I think there even was a three at the time with Easy Hoon still there and yeah they turned out pretty good the only uh ogen event i managed to attend was the spring finals and they just happened to make it and win it so i am <laughs> destined for greatness when it comes to the teams i follow i'm still a samsung fan now though that's not going so well i think there's some bright spots though true all right well here comes the siege in the mid lane just more play around this dragon and why would Najin do anything else? They can easily snowball off these dragons. They're playing this comp absolutely as they should. Just keep forcing KT to engage into you. That <laughs> They don't have any way to do it. Our flash is available, so you'd have to think Najin's being poor with their position if even those flashes are relevant. Melee champions need to get into melee range for their CC. A lot of control over this particular choke. Someday's going to walk through it himself. Uh, they only have OQ there right now, doing damage for the sign. Someday getting very low. Pure nearly dies. Oh. There is a four-man equalizer. Holy cow, that AoE Duke just going on cleanup duty after that engage. And KT, that engage just doesn't work. The Renekton gets hooked, and there is nothing they can do to CC OQ. OQ had the freest number of auto attacks on the side that I have seen from an AD in a while. And all KT can do with these melee champions is try to get in melee range for CC, which means the moment they realize they have to back away, they layer on a beautiful equalizer from Duke. Damned if they do, damned if they don't, are KT. <laughs> well, uh, I think this composition has obvious flaws to it when it was selected, and I'm just so... I'm so confused because looking at the start of the season, KT's draft was so airtight. They were getting away with picking a lot of power picks, really intelligent compositions. But where has that gone now for them? Because picking this Renekton, picking a composition with no engage means that this Renekton is never going to be useful as long as Najin keeps pr just pushing them into these face checks. Najin realizes this. They set up on the Dragon every time and KT doesn't have a choice. And it isn't just the compositional picks, Monte Cristo. It was the rotational play from KT as well. I note one of their first series, it might have been against Anarchy. It was very early in the season. They fast pushed down the turret of Ixu uh, with Siva, which of course has been one of their big pickups. Fast pushed it, ensure that the lane would reverse push. Hecarim went top with no... Uh-oh, here we go. Edge going to get engaged. But the, that actually, OQ comes in from the side with just an auto attack. OQ just had the red buff stolen away from him by score. Anyway, continue, early in this game. Yeah, they, they, they engineered a reverse push against a no-flash level four Hecarim, and then just path score on Rek'Sai to top and ganked him, and it was just all very clean and had a lot of forethought. Here they're drafting comps that have power. For example, Re Renekton and uh, Rek'Sai are going to really win a skirmish battle top against Rumble and Evelyn, but we've never really said the words Renekton and Rek'Sai together because he's never ganked the lane. Oh, and... Now that is just outside of the realm of possibility, OQ, he basically has no threat this game. And as a Sivir, that is highly problematic because if you leave a Sivir with no threat, well, Sivir happens to then become one of the highest DPS AD carries because she has that ricochet and the auto attack reset, can do an absolutely ungodly amount of damage the only thing that usually prevents her from doing that is the short range and the threat of engage. But without that, might as well just be free autos. And if you just roll your head through all the games you've cast, Monte Cristo, how many times have you said a Siva who fights so aggressively with her tank line, usually in less than 500 auto attack range, has had little to no threat? It's one of the most risky champions to do the damage, but can do it so well if there's no one in 500 range to do damage to her. But this game, as you mentioned, it's melee range or nothing for KT, and that's just serving up kill after kill to OQ. Arrow's going to get caught out here, has to Valk. OQ coming up from the bottom side. Taking a look at items as well. Someday, going for the Black Cleaver again, except this time there's not the same synergy that he had in the last game with that Sivir. 
Uh, Corky and the Victor not going to be really benefiting from the stacks he puts down to the same degree. CDR is helpful in a fight, but I completely agree. You need at least one true AD champion to be able to synergize. You could argue score, but of course not building any true damage herself is the Rek'Sai. The Phage helps him navigate fights. Maybe it makes him a bit more sticky because the Rage Passive gives him that 20 flat movement speed, but it's not really itemizing for team fights. He finishes the Black Cleave, and I spent a lot of gold on offensive stats. And if he just gets kited and dies, it just, you know, it's wasted gold. You know what's going to happen? What's going to happen? He's going to get kited and die. That's, uh, that's a spoiler right there, Monty, because <laughs> that's almost 100% going to happen. Here's a, here's a question. Is it a spoiler if I'm actually a seer and can see the future? I mean, to me it would be, because I don't know that you're that. <laughs> now you're spoiling that you're a seer. <laughs> I, I said, would it be? It's a hypothetical. If I did it. <laughs> I see how it is. Yes. Conditional statements are bound. What's the conditional statement for KT's victory here? If everyone DCs? Yeah, that's that's about the same level we're looking at. Fixer gets caught out. Watch the fall of damage. There's an the equalizer. Are they going to keep going in? Yes, OQ's just going to flash. Edge of the front lines, but he's going to get torched by Duke and poisoned by Cassiopeia. Goong with the kill on the Victor. And Najin looked to be turning this into a Baron. You can see the wave clear in mid. Who's alive? Certainly not score. Now, he does have the ultimate available and it respawns and there is a tunnel towards the blue buff but 20 seconds looking like a hell of a long time when the baron's already at 4000 health yeah that is going to be very rapid cassiopeia and the leandries doing their work on the baron Najin cleanly grabs the purple worm and arrow just getting caught out right here oq isn't blown back actually looked like because of the spell shield and then you see that once again the equalizer come through mostly for the cc effect but the triple flash play from pure was what really allowed them to come out to this fight with more than one kill a great fight from Najin finding arrow by himself i loved oq's aggressive flash right there getting more and more damage down after the duke equalizer and the follow-up on that ability and I must say, I've never been a fan of Arrow on the Corky. We've seen very long games where he just doesn't get much damage done. And Trinity Force Bloodthirst does a little bit of poke, but certainly no real damage. Because it's just not damage modified. It's not attack speed or crit. Yeah, and he may not need that much damage right now. Evelyn just starting to get tanky. Uh, Duke has his Zonias, but there's not a really big true tank on this team yet. But yes, the later this game goes, the bigger problem that bloodthirster becomes Imagine just poking around three to oh and dragons they can easily kite back and have so much advanced warding and minion waves pushing in as oku oh, just goes crazy geez. on someday remember he has no armor whatsoever almost dies to what four five auto attacks well oku zeroing in on a bloodthirster right now he's got so much money and that means that someday can't really split push any longer either. Purely itemized to try and tussle with Rumble, a tussle that we never saw that was oft alluded to in Champion Select, but never actually happened. Another auto turret goes down, only one left on the map, and Najin gonna make it academic and pick up that fourth dragon. Wow, so this will set him up for a 40 minute dragon number five if they want to go for it. The dragon drought for KT stretches into nine consecutives in this best of three. Ask okay. the statisticians out there, has there been a best of three series where one team did not pick up a single dragon? Okay, maybe in a first v last, but even then. Okay, Najik going hard again. Edge still trying to play the outside. No further commitment. There's the Sivirold now. Now they want to go in. Equalizer into the choke point, into the jungle. Not sure there's going to be enough follow-up damage though, Goong wants the flank but there's not really a whole lot they could do there score chilled on the equalizer for about four ticks took 800 health but they will be able to pick up their blue buff not surrendering much map control that time oq's ultimate didn't really lead to a lot no i think a little bit split call there from Najin, kind of decided to engage then disengage and then re-engage again and by that time kt was too far gone to make it work and actually they're gonna lose a tower for it in the end or very close. Dramatically out positioned, but even just pure opening up was enough to dissuade KT and get them to back away. 
four minutes or so, five minutes even, till Dragon spawns, and that forces a fire from KT. It was notable that the fourth Dragon was in complete vision of KT, so they do have an exact timer. But is there a fight they can win 8,000 gold behind with this Renekton that really hasn't contributed much over the course of these two games? With their very large lack of engage, you have to think that the best, the best situation is a some sort of vision advantage where someday happens to get over, flash over a wall and get onto OQ instantly. It's about the best you could hope for in any situation here from KT. It's just not many percentage plays for KT, and that's how they drafted. They went for something very linear. They had, knew they had a lot of melee champs. They knew they needed to win the laning phase quite extensively. That's okay. the ultimate use. That's going to be a flank onto the carries of KT. Duke gets right on top of Arrow, going to Zonia's just to keep himself alive. Fixer has to flash out of that. Someday flashing as well, but OQ on the hunt, and that is a dead crocodile. Nice new cowboy boots for OQ right there to go along with his motley crew of four <laughs> items, pushing very strong into the mid lane. Still no true armor item, only just slight armor picked up. Dukes dueling against Arrow, has the flash available, overheats for the big damage auto attack. And you can pretty much pencil this one in. Najin gonna break the base easily. Yeah, they will. Keep on walking forward as well. OQ with the big Bloodthirster shield is not going to be afraid. That's it. And another inhibitor down. They can wait out. Only three minutes until the next Dragon. How cautiously would they like to play this game? One would think they'd like to play pretty cautiously. Man, Duke has been great. Away from his usual kind of playstyle. He's been early picking Hecarim and then dealing with bad matchups like the Nah, like a beast most of the season, four and one on that Nah. But now he moves over to the meta favorite of the two top laners we're gonna see in the next match. Both Marin and Trace have been really prioritizing that rumble. And you can see why. Even when you can, whenever you can hit those equalizers, both the zoning equalizers and the layering of that spell have been lovely. Well, one thing about Duke that I've noticed is that while he does have that great laning phase uh, and he's very dive resistant, one, his fault is that sometimes he's a bit late to the party when his team fights. This series, he has been there every single time with his team to follow up at the right time, and that is unusual for him as a player. I know from talking to people that sometimes he's not the chattiest in terms of voice comms, that he, he gets rather quiet, so it has been an issue that I know Najin has had in terms of getting him to communicate in the best possible manner with the team, but he's been really on point this evening. And honestly, putting him on Rumble Duty, basically forces that playstyle because you're not building Trinity Force like the Hecarim. You're not building damage in general. Your turret pushing threat is quite minimal. You really excel in team fights, and he rushed the Leandries. He's been in position. If this helps him develop that side of the game on champions that do have that split push pressure, it could be beneficial for the team as a whole as the Death Sentence does land, but not committing on a dive on score. No, oh, and they're just going to back off right there. OQ taking the Lantern. And Goon is slowly pushing up the super minion wave in the mid lane. It's a minute between Baron and fifth dragon. Now, how do Najin want to play around these objectives? They're going to have the Scuttle Crab vision, so guaranteed vision for the next two minutes around the Baron that's going to spawn in 10 seconds could be big. They cancel the back on Fixer, but don't look for much more. Well, they could just do it so fast as Evelyn makes her way. Watch that now wants to get into this Baron pit. I don't have blue buff on Goon, so he's going to use a lot of his mana bar to take this down. Scores in the area, and Baron's at 5,000 health. TP coming in from Someday, and Pure trying to flay people backwards. Watch on the side. Here comes Duke. Someday just going to get kited out right there. Box zoning out the rest of the team, and that is Fixer falling also. Arrow on the opposite side. Watch dies. So does Pure, but where is the follow-up? OQ here chasing away Edge. Does he want to go for this? More poison down on to score. Duke with the flank. Can they get Goom? The answer is no. Goom gets a little bit of a heal there. It's like dangerous game, baby. They're looking to maybe go back and pick up this Baron. Notably, the Dragon is up in 15 seconds. It'd be the safer objective. But they're going to try and rush it down, even without the smite. And even though Goon's at 50% mana, seems like it's still going to be academic. Yeah, it is. They're going to back off. However, this could... No, it's not going to result in... I lied. It's not going to result in a counter dragon at all. Everyone from Najin will get there in plenty of time. No TP on someday. Void rush on score, but he's still got 20 seconds. So 
Still no shot. That was the right call for sure for Najin. And it's just what a KT to do with fiercely melee champions, with melee range engage, fighting around a baron with an obvious choke for them to back into that plays right into Rumble's hands. The equalizer splits the team. They pick up both the diver and dive onto the enemy. Najin playing these team fights so intelligently and stacking advantages. Fifth dragon and baron picked up at 40 minutes. Great shot calling. Just. The Baron was definitely the right call based on the timers and the, the summoners and ultimates available. And just the terrain. It's just not team fightable for KT, which, look, probably tells you a lot about their awkward drafting this game. But even those edge cases where they could have gotten a big lead in the laning phase, they just never really played into them. OQ has two static shivs. Gives you a lot of movement speed, but <laughs> probably not the best <laughs> use of gold. Yeah, uh, could you know, could have gone Phantom Dancer, but whatever. Yeah, he probably didn't have the gold found answers, about two, three hundred between the two, but I'm not going to justify the pickup. It's a bit of manners coming through in the items. I think this is a bit of manners coming through in the items. Yoma's Ghost Blade probably would have been a better investment too if he was lower on the gold, but they're going to push up fifth dragon Baron buff minions. Dive, Good take the luck. turret, do whatever you want. Good luck to KT as they trying to hold out two five dragon games back-to-back -back from Najin. I can say we have never seen that this season. Two Five Dragon shutouts, Monte Cristo. <laughs> Jeez, what a dominating performance from Najin here against KT. We definitely expected more of a fight, but Najin looking very tight and KT confused over the course of this series. They're being surprisingly defensive with all the bus. Finally popped the ultimate from Oku, but looks like once again the team isn't coming into any sort of dive. It's gonna swiftly back away. Well. At the same time, they know that's KT's only way to win this game. So they they really shouldn't do that. They should just play this methodically. They're going to cut off the wave right here. Duke, the designated player to go clear out these minions and then just stop the wave right outside of the base and walk forward with his own minions. It's going to take some time, but this is how you want to play it if you're Najin, honestly. And it takes five dragons, but finally Duke is a threat to minion waves. Because, of course, <laughs> the Flame Splitter does reduce damage to minions, but because every tick applies the 40 damage from the fifth dragon, you clear pretty good. Pretty well. <laughs> this is where we've gotten to, the grammar fight. Uh, well, there's nothing else to fight about in this game. Certainly KT's not going to be fighting, so they I might fight with you to. instead. That's fair. <laughs> I would say that uh, our fight is not as one-sided, but that would be a lie. Okay, here we go. As Edge just going to back away off the equalizer. And now Score gets hit by the flay. Goong going to pick up the kill. Someday tries to get into the mix. Box goes down immediately. And Goong getting low, but not quite low enough. Hook on the arrow. And there is OQ with the triple kill. And that's going to be the end of this game. A massive crit coming through from Oku. That'll be the game. Complete whitewash from Najin in many different ways. 10 and 0 in the Dragon Counter over two games. Unheard of neutral control by Najin EM Fire. And as, as questionable as KT was tonight, you cannot take away the fact that Najin really showed some excellent shot calling. Uh, much better map movement than we've seen in the past. I was concerned after coming, seeing that big loss to Jin Air, but they bounced back hard. And KT has to do some reevaluating in the second half of this season. That second round, Robin Edge in particular, he got that advantage in the mid lane, but then lost it nearly immediately due to bad decision making. It's notable that Edge, look, he played two games against Spenu. That was always going to be a one side series. A fairly impressive performance against Faker in game two, in a game that was, again, still very one side.